Hello everyone, week seven, Wine Talks with Frank Schmulders. Today we will be talking about wine folds. Uh, let me invite Frank to the session. Okay, hi Frank. Good evening. Hi, Good people. evening. There we are How, again. Yeah, there we are again. How are you? Good, good. The weather is nice. Yeah. Still quite stiff, <laughs> but uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, the weather is amazing today here as well, and I have so much. I'm like so much looking forward to go on vacation, <laughs> a beach vacation now. <laughs> mm. But it needs to wait for a while, for a bit more. Oh yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. Well, things are opening up a little bit everywhere. Our government yeah. is, is right now, as we speak, announcing uh, um, future, you know, um, changes and mm -hmm. uh, the lockdown. So uh, restaurants will be, with limitations, be uh, reopened first of June probably. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 um, to my surprise, uh, I was really waiting for that for. Um, you know, like fitness centers to be reopened. Um, this is not gyms, you know. This is uh -huh. not going to happen be apparently before the 1st of September for some reason. And that's wow. crazy. Yes. I, I don't understand that, actually. Maybe it's a mistake. We'll see. Hmm. Yeah. Because here they already published a four-stage plan. Yeah. And uh, I think the gyms, sports centers, is on the stage one, I think. They're going to open soon, the gyms. But depending on where you are and then only with the, with the appointment only. But now, also as we speak, I don't know if they publish it yet but or not. I mean, the government, today parliament has... Um, meeting they're voting or they're supposed to vote today if they're going to extend the state of emergency yeah, yeah. or not so we will know it this afternoon this tonight this evening so let's yeah. see i was reading this morning that in spain um, uh, it's becoming very political again as always yeah 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 now it is really political but in the meantime anyway. let's talk about wine yes let's talk <laughs> okay. about wine Great. So welcome everyone again. Uh, today we will be talking about wine faults. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, wine fault is obviously very broad because there are several different types of wine faults. And I know that you really want to talk about bread. I really mm -hmm. want to talk. But maybe we can leave the bread a little bit towards the, the, the middle of the session. Yeah, and sure. sh yeah, should, we, should we just do a little bit like repass of how many different types of wine faults exist and and how to detect them like to we should we like list them a little bit mm, sure i didn't think of it that way but go ahead yes how okay. many wine faults there are my god i mean maybe there's maybe even there's more than we know what we know but like okay i can name it a few oxidation the basic one of the basic ones sure and Cork taint TCI, TCA, obviously, the, the yeah. first one that people think. Yeah. And then uh, reductive taints. Yeah. And what else? Um, volatile acidity. Sure. Uh, bread, obviously, bread, yeah. bretomyces. Sure. sure. And then what else we have? Uh, okay, there's one uh, wine fault that I really like lately. It's happening a lot with the natural wines. The the mouse notes, mouse mouse smells. Yes, yeah, yes. mouse Yes, Primox, premature yeah. oxidation. Well, you you mentioned oxidation, but oxidation has many shapes. But uh, premox is maybe a particular problem uh, nowadays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what else we have? Ah, okay. This is pretty much basic, but second ferment, I mean, if the wine starts to ferment again in the bottle. Sure, doing a second fermentation or a malolactic so, fermentation. Malolactic fermentation in the bottle. Yes. And then uh, tartar, uh, tartar crystals. Mm. It yeah. is not maybe real, no, I mean, it's not. It's not really a fault, but it's, it's, fault, it can be yeah. problematic, commercially speaking, that's true. See, okay. Yeah. Um, someone is asking D-acetyl. Hmm? Diacetyl. Diacetyl, it's, is it a fault? Diacetyl? Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. 
Yeah. What? How to detect that? What is? What is a? Uh, how to detect DS? I never. I didn't hear DS before. Is it part of like no. volatile? I'm, I'm, no. Yeah. I don't know actually. I'm. I'm sort of. Uh, I have to go deep in my memory. I'm not sure actually. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. No. Okay. I'm not sure. Um. Uh, and then I. I another question. Do you think this herbal aromas and presinous, like presine, presine and kerosene notes, is it a wine fault or is it a style? I think, uh, yeah, it's maybe not literally a wine fault, you know, um, but it's, um, yes, it's a style. It's, it's, it's something maybe quite often created in the vineyards. It's, it's maybe not a winemaking fault, at least. It depends on how you see faults. Huh? Yeah. But, um, but of course, um, um, it, a bit of it is, is not a problem. But if it is getting more, then the wine becomes unbalanced in its aromas, and then it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then it's... But I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't literally call it a fault, maybe. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Uh, Tiny says oak. <laughs> yeah, wrong, a wrong no. use of oak might be disturbing. No, 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 that's, <laughs> no, not, that's true. not oak. Yeah. No. Um, so, uh, and Patrick says volatile acidity. Yes, we we mentioned the volatile sure. acidity. Sure. And TDN. Hmm? TDN can be if it is a okay. Uh, the H Rieslings they have more TDN. And then they kind of produce this petrol-like aromas. Yeah. But is it a fault with the young Rieslings? This is also a little bit debate, I think, lately. It's a debate. It's a debate. Um, um, it appears that um, this can be, but isn't necessarily, but can be the result of skin burn of Riesling grapes, you know, exposed to too mm -hmm. much sunlight and maybe also heat. And uh, mm -hmm. apparently, uh, the, the, the skin of the Riesling grape is quite sensitive to that. Quickly sh begins to shrivel and develop some orange color. The orange color comes from carotene. And mm -hmm. in the fermentation, the carotene can produce strong kerosene aromas. That is the theory. Okay. But, mm -hmm. um, but the problem is with, for me, at least with Riesling, is that uh, there are plenty of Rieslings that do not have any skin burn at all. Where in, in the, when the wine is young, you would rather speak of, let's say, minerality. And then with mm -hmm. age, that minerality turns into more kerosene-like aromas. And so I wouldn't necessarily call it, in, call it a fault. But it is true that the perception of, of kerosene aromas in Riesling has changed over time. Mm -hmm. A long time ago in my first wine education... I learned that uh, you could recognize a great Riesling by its kerosene aromas. And nowadays, some people say, no, it's a fault. So I, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, actually, in this case. But, um, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, no, I wouldn't necessarily call it a fault. It's uh, fault. maybe more a style of Riesling that you like or yeah. don't like. I'm, no. I'm not particularly fond of, uh, of, of, of some Australian Rieslings that really reek of, of kerosene. But... Um, but it's a style you can't, I, I wouldn't call it a fault. Mm -hmm. no. uh, yeah, normally I, I thought I, I, I didn't think of it as a fault because, I mean, I always think, okay, especially the aged Rieslings, they develop this aroma. But then lately, I, maybe when I started to think about the wine faults, I started to pay attention more. Mm. I've been reading like so many comments about this and TDN, TDN, people are talking about it. It's a fault it shouldn't be there um so, so then i got surprised like and no. as as everything no. uh, in the wine industry in the wine world everything becomes a debate <laughs> so yeah, this yeah, is a yeah, debate yeah, as yeah. Well. yeah that's true that's yeah. true uh yeah. by the way going back to the acetyl Sherpatoisi says that for the acetyl we feel too cheesy creamy or buttery sometimes due to the fact coming from oral malolactic fermentation can you expect mm. this as a wine fault i think it's not a wine fault but it's an off balance wine maybe yeah 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 for sure for sure yeah yeah and i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm i'm i i'm i have not much to say about that subject so i'm, I'm not okay. sure no yeah um so i think uh, ah one more question if the wine is beyond its shelf life would you consider that as a fault I mean, in, in your, you're in a restaurant and you order a wine and then they serve you a wine which is beyond uh, shelf life, which is yeah. past its time. Yeah. Would yeah. you return it back 
Is it the fault? Yeah, well, at that moment, the wine is, is in a way faulty. Yeah, that's true. But but um, I I also re I also remember discussions with in in wine courses in the past where people would say if the wine is too young, uh, too young, uh, mm -hmm. um, then it's actually in a way also faulty. I was like, yeah, but I I don't. But 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 I think personally, for me, uh, talking about faulty wine is much more related to faulty wine making actually. So mm -hmm. an aged, a too old wine. That's that's not a it's not a human fault. It's just that the wine got too old, and and and, and that's it. You know. So yeah, it depends on how you look at it. But I wouldn't use the word fault for it. I would just say it's too old. Too so, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yes, when we talk about wine faults, yes, I know that you you are like kind of. Uh, it's like it's it's also this lately it is a little bit different how wine falls become integrated in the wine as a wine style. Mm -hmm. For example, bread, right? Yeah, or volatility actually. Yeah. Or volatility, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Or this mousy, mousy smell, mousiness or with mousy. the. Yeah. yeah, with the with the natural wines, it's like a, they describe this as a funky aromas of natural wines. Yeah, but mousiness is really a fault, after my opinion. Yeah. It suppresses it suppresses the the aromas of the grape, you know. Mm -hmm. And I would I would believe that a natural wine should smell and taste as purely as possible after the grape. And then mousiness mm -hmm. is spoiling that smell. So I'm sorry, I cannot. Re I can really not see the quality of that. Huh? Mm -hmm. That that is the problem, of course. But you know, it's not. It's not always 100% clear. Let's take let's take volatility. Eh? Now, okay. if I think of wines where you often have a volatile character, I'm thinking of two examples: Sauterne and Priot. I was gonna say Priot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, um, and in Sauterne. Um, it's it's so part of it. Eh? It's caused by botrytis. It's caused because during the fermentation, uh, um, um, when the the concentration of botrytis in the grapes is too high, then the, as a byproduct of fermentation, the yeast produce mm -hmm. volatility, and it's it's part of Sauternes. We're used to it. We accept it, and so in Sauternes we don't see it as a fault. Although, having said that, having tasted Chateau d'Ichem many 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 times in my life. I never detected so much volatility in Nikem. So mm -hmm. hmm, uh, that that's that also says something. And for mm -hmm. example in in Tokai, neither. But um but of course Asu grapes are have a different kind of botrytis compared to to Sotern because the grapes are much more dried. And so apparently there's an influence there as well. So mm -hmm. on the one hand we have volatility in Sotern, which we apparently find acceptable and will not see as a fault. Mm -hmm. um, and Priorat, there are plenty of Priorat wines that have uh, quite high volatility levels, and we also do not see them really as a fault. But mm -hmm. I have to admit that in Priorat, I'm a little bit less forgiving. I don't know why, and I know it's completely subjective, but mm -hmm. um, Priorats that have too much volatility, I cannot appreciate, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's that sort of aggressive smell of glue, eh, because that's mm -hmm. basically what it is, or of, of acetone, nail polish remover. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that shouldn't be in a wine, and it's in, it's it has always been there in Priorat, you know. Since I came to Priorat in the early nineties, I've been, and I actually I was always asking winemakers, where do you think it comes from? And they would say, well, no, it's no, the nobody style. Really knew. <laughs> huh? the teruo, it's the style yeah, or yeah, terroir of, of course, Priorat. Yeah, it's the soil and that, but it's, that's of course nonsense. Soil doesn't produce yeah. volatility, and um, and I, I I noticed that some. There were wines that never showed it um, mm -hmm. for some reason. And I got the feeling by that time that it had to do with the moment of picking, actually. And mm -hmm. later on, and, but this is a little bit my personal theory about Priorat and volatility, is that um, um, with these old vines on the Licorelia soils in the hot climate of Priorat, um, you see, if you, if you watch the grapes during harvest, and I've seen that many times, you will mm -hmm. see that in every bunch of Ganacha grapes, we're talking about Ganacha, uh, to a lesser extent also Cariñena, you find some completely shriveled grapes. Mm -hmm. And it's my theory that these shriveled grapes produce the volatility. And I actually have the impression that you sometimes can even smell already before fermentation that, that sort of oxidative, volatile character in those shriveled grapes. In any case, what is interesting about it 
and that and that is um, which supports maybe my theory is that since Alvaro Palacios installed an optical sorting machine mm -hmm. and with that getting rid of all the shriveled grapes um, I have his wines have become much less uh, affected by volatility as they were in the past so mm -hmm. I, I think it's got to do with that in, in the case of Priorat mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I think that 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 uh, the producers in Priorat should be uh, very precise in the moment of harvesting and even then do a selection probably manual because an optical sorting machine as far as I know uh, uh, Alvaro is the only one who, who's got one in Priorat. Maybe I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but they're bloody expensive. So, um, and most sellers are too small for that. So they would probably have to sort by hand. But I think they have to. They should do mm -hmm. that to avoid the, the, the volatility. I, I personally, I mean, I'm. I think less uh, tolerance. I, mean, I have less tolerance for volatile acidity uh, mm. because I always think that volatile acidity, a good winemaker can avoid that or should avoid that. Yeah. And it is a yeah. poor wine making skills or pure he poor he hygiene. So yeah. I when there's volatile acidity and when winemaker says no it's the style, mm. I'm like <laughs> no, no it is true. not. I agree. I agree. It's actually also one of the problems with natural wine making that you in not all of them, eh, but in some of them you'll find quite elevated levels of volatile acidity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, actually we have this uh, there is this uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place, actually. It's a, uh, um, an enoteca in the center of Firenze that has mm -hmm. a great range of wines, very good food, and, the, and most of the wines are natural wines. And the owner always says, no VA, no fun. Um, oh, I think no, that's, it's no a good fun. joke, but I don't agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good joke. And um, here there's a comment, actually, uh, saying that, um, let me see, let me find it. Uh, Hokar from Chateau Moussard says that volatile acidity helps the wine to age. Do you believe that? I don't know. I, mm. I think it helps the wine to become a vinegar, <laughs> not to age, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that at all. I think because... Yeah. But it, it, I, I can imagine that you have to relate it also to the, the type of wine, the tannic structure of the wine, etc. But helping mm -hmm. to age, I do not believe in that at all. But maybe that in certain wines, like Chateau Moussard, um, that they sort of, mm, how should I say, in a way sort of support or integrate that volatility better than other wines. And in the case of Priorat, to come back to that issue, with Priorat, we, you know, with the sky high alcohol, the, the rather low tannic level because of Ganacha and the mm -hmm. low acidity as well, um, th those wines do not age very well, generally speaking. It's one of my main criticisms on Priorat. It doesn't age beautiful mm -hmm. wines, but they don't age very well, generally speaking. And the mm -hmm. volatility is, is not helpful. It's actually making it worse in many cases. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Miki Pavlok is, is asking, how do you distinct volatility from the bacterial spo spoilage, which also gives nail polish aromas? Mm, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know. I think in volatile acidity, mm -hmm. uh, in volatile acidity, I think there is different... Uh, different ways or different types of volatile acidity i think mm. depending on the ester is produced yes mm. one is the nail polish and the varnish and you know the rubber mm. notes but also mm. you can get merceptans which are you know cabbage or rotten eggs and if it is maybe it can be even lead to almost like balsamic vinegar smell mm, but merceptans are not volatile acidity no it's a different category well, you're the chemist. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, I'm a chemist. I'm a chemist, chemist. but since, since, <laughs> since 2007, I never worked as a chemist. So it has been like 13 years. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Yeah, but so, I mean, but what I know, but I remember from mm. my chemistry years is uh, volatile acidity is, is, is like a, if the acidic acid bacteria is present, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it reacts again, the, pro the, the product of acidic acid bacteria reacts again with the alcohol and then yeah. it forms an ester. Yeah. And then depending, and there are several different types of esters and depending uh, of the type of ester, it can give you different uh, volatile aroma. 
Ah, okay. okay. Volatile acidity. So yeah. I think if I'm not wrong, Merceptan is one of them. But mm. uh, again, it has been 13 years from my chemistry mm. uh, knowledge school years. Mm. So I'm not really uh, 100% sure. Mm. So uh, one of your Turkish friends asks whether VA gets reduced during filtration and before bottling. I would say no. I don't think so. I know one technique to get rid of volatile acidity because basically you cannot return volatile acidity. If it's there, it's there. Huh? Mm -hmm. And you, there's nothing you can do with the wine to, to sort of reduce it again. Yeah. Um, but I know from one Priorat winery where they, they're working with a certain consultant winemaker who, mm -hmm. um, who uh, treats the wine with reverse osmosis okay. after the winemaking. And by doing that, he removes the VA. Okay, so but possible. with remo reverse osmosis, you can also remove other things as well in the wine. Exactly. So you can maybe, exactly. yeah, and then you're, you're, you may damage the wine. Exactly. Yeah? It's, not, it's not a great technique, but, um, but um, I know that wine quite well. It's, it's a good wine. It's a solid wine, yeah. but, it's, it's, but it's not one of the best mm -hmm. for us. And... Yeah. Um, uh, but he, they, apparently he is doing the reverse osmosis process just to get rid of the VA. So, because the advantage by, of doing that is that he first goes for complete overripeness of grapes. Mm -hmm. And then he, and then, you know, after that, he corrects the wine, maybe also in other aspects, maybe he's also reducing the alcohol a little bit. I don't know, with reverse osmosis. It's, it's a very, it's, it's the complete opposite of a natural approach, of course. It's a very technical approach. Um, but as I said, the wine is good, but mm -hmm. not great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can obviously prevent VA, but uh, I think you cannot cure it. Uh, no. Dave, David Bird, no. master of wine uh, and chemist, he's, he has an amazing, I mean, to me, one of my favorite books, mm. Understanding Wine Technology, yeah, and yeah. I think it's a Bible for all the WSET students. Exactly. I always go and refer back to his, his book, and he says with volatile acidity, only curious, just leave it and then hope that it become a nice vinegar. Or and then or also he says you can use the wine for cooking because mm -hmm. with the temperature volatile acidity uh, will evaporate. Mm -hmm. So then you won't have that flavor obviously and you can use it as a cooking wine. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, one last question about VA and then we'll jump to bread. Uh, would you say that uh, would you say the grape shriveling is generally the cause of VA seems to be contacted with the areas where the grapes are dried by botrytis or apacimiento? Mm, well, maybe, maybe, um, but but probably shriveling is not even going in exactly the same way in every in every case you know I, I have the impression that there are differences because if for example as i said there's a difference between the shriveled grapes of uh, the botrytis grapes of sotean and the botrytis grapes of, of tokai because in tokai you have much more wind and mm -hmm. the ashu grapes are clearly dried they're much smaller they're brown they're brown, mm -hmm. whereas sauterne grapes are like moldy, they're hairy, they look disgusting actually, you wouldn't put it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so shriveling and shriveling, not exactly the same thing apparently. Uh, so it depends, mm -hmm. uh, probably depends on where you are. And again, I, I'm sh pretty sure it also has to do with the variety. Mm -hmm. Thick skin, thin skin, whatever. Thin skin. Yeah. Okay, next wine fault, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which bread. is open to debate, bread, yeah. Yes. Bread, is this a wine fault or is it a good thing or is it a new trend? What is it, bread? No, it's a big yeah. wine fault and it's a bad thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think people completely misunderstand what bread really is, actually. Uh, first of all, of course, bretonomyces is a kind of yeast and it has this uh, nasty side effect of, uh, of influencing the wine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that I think the problem is well as my as my good friend Ferdinand Meyer always says, too many people taste too much with their nose, just mm -hmm. focusing on aromas. So mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, hey, you know, what's the problem with bread? What's the problem have, of having a light influence of animal aromas, of horse sweat, whatever? It makes the wine more complex. It's actually, uh, if it's not too much, it's maybe even a rather nice smell, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
Yes, of course. I mean, if you if you like the smell of horse sweat, then be my guest. You know, uh, personally, I'm not very fond of the smell of horses, but but it's got nothing to do with that. In the end, it's not about that. What people do not realize and do not pay attention to is what happens on the palate, because actually, um, as you know, most um, uh, most wines with bread are red wines, and. Uh -huh. um, 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 and it has a, a negative influence on tannins. The, po the problem with wines with bread is that they become rather metallic in the aftertaste, and that mm -hmm. sort of metallic character in combination with the bitterness and the, the tannic sensation of, of, red, of red grapes, red skins, creates a shorter and, and less pleasant finish. And that's mm -hmm. a fault, you know? Yes. So... I, th I think people are, are looking at it completely the wrong way. They're just talking about the aromas and whether you like horse sweat or not. But it's, mm -hmm. that's not the issue. The issue is mm -hmm. it makes the wine shorter. It spoils the finish. It's really uh, uh, negative for wine quality. So there is no place for bread in any way. Yeah. So even if it is only with the nose of the aromas, yes, you may like the horse and farmyard smell. No. But if it is too much, also it is also uh, making the wine out of balance. It's covering the fruit of aromas, course. no? Of course, if so, it's too much, the wine becomes one-dimensional. Actually, mm -hmm. it smells too much of horse sweat and not enough yeah. of of the grape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. with the bread, I think there's also uh, different uh, approaches. Like few pe people say that if it is a, 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 like a kind of a optimum amount of bread, it adds complexity. And then other people, scientifically speaking, no, there shouldn't be any bread in the wine. Um, so what about Chateau Bocastel? Chateau Bocastel has, and he, Chateau Bocastel is famous with yeah. the bready wines. Well, it, yes, but it was much more bready in the past than it is nowadays. And uh, I know Bocastel quite well. Um, mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that the, the, the owners, the Perrin family, um, first, for 20 years or more, they, they said, there is no bread in our wines, you, you, you don't get it, it's a terroir, whatever. And then finally, nowadays, they say, yeah, well, it's true, we've got more bread. They, they think it is related to the Mourvedre grape. They mm -hmm. think that the Mourvedre variety is particularly prone to bread. And actually, this could be true. It could be true. Because actually, um, I think there's a lot about bread that we still do not understand very well. Um, mm -hmm. um, why it is related mostly to red wine, for example, and not to whites. Um, it seems to happen uh, much more in warm areas than in cold areas. Uh, with, and that means that due to climate change, actually, the amount of bread and wines is increasing. There are more and more... Um, let's say regions where you'll find bread now um mm -hmm. so and, and but but if you if you ask uh, i've i've asked a few questions at geisenheim university um and the professor of course every professor at a, at a at a university will tell you bread is bad and bread has no place in wine and blood it's a huge fault blah 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 but um but but the interesting thing is if you then start asking questions um, they will admit that that there's not everything is clear yet about bread. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, there was yeah. a very interesting uh, um, project done a few years ago, a small project by uh, Leonid Farev, a Russian wine academiker, mm -hmm. who for his wine academy thesis uh, did a thesis around bread. And um, what he did, it was very interesting. He First of all, he started looking for... Um, wines by reading uh, tasting notes in wine magazines and he selected wines where wine magazines were talking a lot about you know um, stable farmyard horse mm -hmm. aromas mm -hmm. and from and those wines he ordered bottles okay and then he had those bottles analyzed in a laboratory mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. see how much bread they had and some of them actually wow. had, indeed had very high levels of bread uh, and then he uh, sampled wines with bread to winemakers and sommeliers, not mm -hmm. saying that he was checking it on bread. He just asked them to judge the wine, etc. And the interesting thing was that, that they all liked those wines a lot, right. including yeah. the winemakers. Um, but when he then uh, com confronted them with the fact that they were actually all wines with very high bread levels, the winemakers were very upset, upset. very upset, because oh. they realized that they were actually 
highly appreciating wines with very high levels of bread. And, mm -hmm. and they felt that um, they shouldn't have done that. They, they were ashamed that they had done that because they realized that they apparently hadn't noticed the bread, whereas intrinsically they felt that it was a mind-making mistake. Mistake. Well, very interesting and yeah? very creative yeah. way of doing it. I'm going to ask Leonel for the, for the thesis to read. Uh, yeah. But also, was, were there, I'm sure some of the wines which has horse smell, they didn't have bread. So this horse farmyard smells, can, can they happen for other reasons? But is it only related to bread? I'm not sure. I, I don't know that. Um, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there can be other ways where you can get slightly similar aromas. It must be, you know, maybe, maybe related to American oak, for example. I'm not, I'm not, I'm okay. not hundred percent sure. sure. But for me, you know, whenever I smell a wine, where I'm thinking, hmm, I, this, this, this seems bratty to me. Then I pay extra attention to how the wine is showing itself on the finish, on the palate. Okay. Uh, and then I will know, you know, and, um, and, and almost always you get that very metallic sensation. You think, oh my, it is bread, you know, and it is mm -hmm. bread. Yeah. But, you know, I've, we have very often in, in lectures, uh, in the international diploma lectures, we have wines with bread. And, and mm -hmm. in many cases, students wouldn't realize that it is bread, would actually like the complexity of bread and, mm -hmm. and are quite, in a way, rather positive about the wines. Yeah. But, but yeah, I think then, it's one and of I, and then I tell them, yeah, but the, try the tenants again. What do you think of the tenants? And then quite, quite often they say, yeah, well, the tenants they're a bit, a bit too dry, a bit, mm -hmm. a bit unpleasant. So, well, that's the bread, my friends. That is exactly mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. yeah, but then uh, thinking about it, yeah, I think myself also. I don't relate if the tenants is unpleasant. I think that maybe it's an unripe grapes. It's early picking, and then. Like having this farmyard aroma and then the tenants, I don't normally link them together and uh, think that it's bread. Mm. I think it's lack of experience as well with the bread, yeah. bread wines, or as you said, yeah. like farmyard aromas. Yes, it, it, it's complexity, and then, yeah. It, yeah. or maybe it's getting fashionable. Yeah, but you know, the, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. But as I said, it's on the increase, huh, bread, and and I think actually natural winemaking and and low sulfur levels and that and things like that are are increasing the problem of course um yeah. but um but but as i said i think there's also a lot that is not still not very well understood and i also had for example uh situations and i have no explanation for it where between two bottles of the same batch I could say mm -hmm. the one the one bottle was very bratty and the next one wasn't i was thinking how the hell is that possible because it's a ferment, it's, it's a yeast problem. So you would imagine that all the wine would have the same problem. The but same I could problem. clearly see a difference between two wines from exactly the same uh, bottling date. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Strange. Oh, interesting. Strange. Very yeah. strange. Uh, Maria is asking, Brett and Chinon, what's up with this pairing? Mm. Is there particularly Brett wines, mostly in Chinon? I'm not really very familiar. No, I'm not, I'm not exactly aware of it, but um, but it could be that, that, I don't know, Cabernet Franc, and, and, you know, lots of wine cellars in that area are very old-fashioned, very traditional. Well, you know, one of the most highly esteemed Cabernet Francs from the Loire Valley, Clos Rougeard, is not completely mm -hmm. free of breads in many vintages. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so, yeah, maybe yeah. that's an issue, but... But I don't know. To, to be very honest, uh, after having made a tour in that area three years ago, um, I've seen a, I saw a lot of dirty winemaking there, not very mm -hmm. clean cellars and all that. And that certainly doesn't help when it comes to okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sergi is asking, do you think that there are less wine faults nowadays than in the past? Yeah, of course. Much less. Much less. Depending on the wine fault, I would say, yes, certain faults, they're much less, but yeah. certain faults like bread and mosinis and stuff, it's increasing, I think, because of the, the, the trend or the choice. Or now it's not maybe increasing uh, on purpose, but now they have an excuse because <laughs> it's more trendy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. 
But you know, let's say generally speaking, sure, wine wine nowadays is much better than it was ever before. Really, there's no doubt about that. If you talk about you know, technique te the the technique of winemaking, but it's true that uh, because of trends nowadays, low sulfur, sulfur, you know, biodynamic wine going into very low, dangerously low sulfur levels sometimes. Not because they mm -hmm. have to, but because they want to. They they. They're pushing it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. further down, further down, further down. And, and that leads to more problems. And actually that leads, for example, quite often to the problem of premature oxidation, premox, which was a huge issue in, in Burgundy, in white Burgundy in the 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century. There mm -hmm. was a lot of expensive white Burgundy that, 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 you know, began to oxidize after five, six, seven years, huge issues. People sending back uh, wines to the importers, the producers refusing responsibility, saying there is no problem. Um, we do add enough sulfur, but later on it was clearly proven that they were all on too low sulfur levels, mm, too and low that sulfur. Uh, and that and that was the main reason for for premox. Yeah, and meanwhile, without the problem is of course with winemakers, they are scared to admit uh, something like that because then they know that they will get a lot of wine sent back and you know and it's a financial huge financial problem so the the typical reaction of winemakers is always to say no no it's got nothing to do with me it's not my fault uh, there is no problem mm -hmm. whatever and then la 10 years later you hear them say yeah well actually, actually. i was too low in my sulfur I'm adding in, I'm using a bit more sulfur now and uh, we have no problems any longer. Well, you know, yeah. once, okay. once all the bottles, the problematic bottles have disappeared from the market, they will, <laughs> market will be more they... happy to admit. Yeah. yeah, because they already have the cash flow. Yeah, it was um, a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, last question, uh, Matt is asking, are there people who taste better uh, be bread faster than others? Well, you know, pro probably, I, I'm not sure if there's any scientific research done on that, but generally speaking, we all have different thresholds for different aromas and, and flavors on the palate. We all have that. So mm -hmm. the one person can be more sensitive to TCA, the next one will be oversensitive maybe to, to bread, uh, and the next person doesn't smell bread at all, but immediately detects uh, VA in the lowest possible uh, uh, quantity. This is something genetic. We have different mm -hmm. thresholds. On the other hand, you can also, um, you can improve your, your, your abilities um, on, on uh, talking about uh, the detection of aromas uh, in time by practicing and by being made aware of it. That, that is also true. But, mm -hmm. but we do have different thresholds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for the, uh, talking about thresholds, reductive taint, uh, is yeah, this also know, depending on the threshold? Because so yeah. many people, they don't detect it. No, it's true. And, and reduction is a bit tricky because I remember um, very old bottles, like really mm -hmm. old um, uh, great Burgundies or Bordeaux's, where in the beginning you were thinking, oh my God, this is corked, because it was really like, uh, um, yeah. Dirty smell? Yeah, a bit dirty, not clean and, and whatever. And then uh, after a while, the wine, or after decanting, for example, the wine opened up completely, and you realized that it was actually reduction. Mm -hmm. So, but reduction, I, I do not consider reduction as a real problem because by by giving air to the wine, reduction disappears. It's as simple disappears. as that. So I'm not too worried about reduction, you know. If mm -hmm. I, but of course you have to realize it is reduction, and you, you sometimes you can be wrong about it for sure. But mm -hmm. but but you know if it's cork um, and you wait, if it's TCA, you wait, the wine will become more corky, and reduction, you wait, it, the wine will become less reductive and more fruity. So that can yeah. be no mistake at the end. Yeah. Yeah, reduction, as you said, there is also a cure of reduction. Yes, aer aerating the, the decanting yeah. and yeah. also uh, copper. Yeah. I did a test the other day. I yeah. opened a New Zealand one, a New Z a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. It was reductive. Yeah. I put a copper coin inside yeah. the glass and waited yeah. like for about a minute and a half. Yeah. And then the wine changed completely. All the like fruit aromas of Sauvignon Blanc came back. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. We've done the test as well. Yeah, no, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. reduction, yeah. 
it's a it's maybe a bit of a fault, but it's a, at least it's a reversible fault. So um, yeah, it is a reversible you, fault. You, you don't have to be stuck with it. No. Okay. Uh, to finish the session, one yeah. uh, comment and question uh, from um, from April. So fights are a popular topic. Being blamed for headaches. Comments. I think we can do an entire session for that. Mm, yeah, but it has been proven that sulfide doesn't do, do not uh, do not give headaches, um, mm -hmm. um, unless you're maybe oversensitive. But but in in ninety nine percent of the cases, headaches do not come from sulfides. They come, I think. Um, Alcohol itself can cause headaches. Histamines mm -hmm. can cause headaches if you are sensitive headaches, yeah. to histamines. And the histamine is a byproduct of fermentation. So there are people who, who quickly get a headache from wine because of histamines. Um, mm -hmm. And otherwise, it's quite often just drinking too much. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, I, Mickey I, says I it's, it's called so. hangover. Huh? Yeah, it's, Mickey, Mickey says, Mickey Paolo, he said it's called hangover. Yeah, exactly. if you drink too it's, much it's alcohol. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we couldn't answer all the questions, guys. Sorry, because today we passed our time. Maybe we yeah. can come back to this question, uh, this topic again another yeah. day and make another session. Thank you, Frank. I'll see you on Thanks, Friday. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening, everybody. See you all on Friday, maybe. Bye-bye. Bye, Irene. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.